so I've got to say to you guys and to anyone else watching this, thank you so much for persevering. This is like the very end of a very long journey. Um, and I think we all just want this done now. So I'm quite happy that we're nearly there um, and uh, that nearly there has a timescale on it. So um, uh, yeah, great. So one of the things that came up in this booking workshop is this both uh, open data and open booking um, is kind of needed to make booking happen. So you need to have the open data feeds and you need to have open booking working. Um, the finalization workshop, if you guys, you guys have obviously were all there. Um, anyone who wasn't, you can go back and watch it on the, um, uh, on the, the W3C subsite of open active. All the videos are up. Um, so just to kind of summarize the changes we've made off the back of that in the workshop, um, those that were there will remember Sean shouting out that he disagreed with the wording of the logical steps. This was previously register. So we're changing this to be identify, which I think everyone thought was reasonable at, at the time. Um, and the other couple of changes we're making following the workshop are um, free text restrictions. Uh, so basically this means that you can now, you can specify as part of an event um, the restrictions that are uh, related to it. So two to one ratio for adults and children swimming is a good example of that. And so that's an extra field in the open data that means that people can see before they, they confirm a booking. Not just there's a gender restriction, not just that there's an age restriction, but also that there might be other restrictions um, that are relevant. Um, so that's this. And sorry, is that in the um, the booking spec or the kind of data model? That will, that will be in the data. That will be in the data model. Okay, perfect. So then, the, but the booking spec um, references that it must be um, uh, displayed as part of the process. Um, and then the attendee instructions, uh, which are already there in the in the model, um, as you say, Izzy. Um, that's there's a, just a, a note in the booking spec that they should be included uh, as part of a confirmation uh, email that gets sent out. This was to Chris Phelps's point that actually, in some situations, um, you might want to send a follow up note to the uh, the customer saying, you know, you know, there are lockers available, or you know, there is uh, whatever that information is that there's something that you might want to tell them about the venue and you can put that in the attendee instructions and send that so the attendee instruction is already used for this anyway so I think people can write exactly this kind of information in don't forget to bring your trainers and so that will just make sure that they'll get that information if it's sent to them um, and then finally I'm trying to arrange uh, a conversation about reconciliation following our previous um, call about reconciliation I think a couple of weeks ago and it was raised as well at the booking workshop as a, as a question um, so we still don't know I think in a couple of weeks I took an action to try and find out from people uh, what they needed in terms of reconciliation data we said maybe an ID was good enough maybe we'd need some more information so I've pinged three people in particular who I know have strong views on this I'm going to try and get information out, out of them next week and build that into the spec um, as far as I'm aware, that's the only thing that's um, not yet well defined. I think we talked about it in enough detail last time that we've got a way forward, which is kind of allows generic reconciliation. It sounded like the last question there was, is it needed? Um, I think that was the last call we had before the booking workshop. We kind of came to that conclusion. We've got a mechanism. It looks like we're happy with it. Is it needed? And so whether that, that reconciliation mechanism will, will be in the actual final spec or not, Will depend, depend on this conversation with these people to see if there's a way we can get around in their use cases where they the people who have said this is what we need um, if there's an alternative that doesn't require that additional property we talked about last time um, we'll we'll just not include that in the spec um, but if if they're happy with what's there then we'll just put it in as it is so hopefully nothing outrageous there from everything we've talked about to date um, so if that's all good um, and nothing, uh, nothing unexpected, um, then the other thing I thought we'd quickly just go through is just this, um, the way that bookings happen, probably just, just to really emphasize 
in some uh, cases, it was unclear the steps that you would take to make a booking if there was a child or an adult involved. And there was conversations about date of birth afterwards and whether you'd ask for date of birth up front to do that. So to make it really clear, when you click book, um, there's actually a, a, another step that we had cut from the deck to make it simple for the workshop. Um, but to, to show you guys what that was that we'd cut out, and I think it actually would have made it slightly made more sense as well as trying to make it simple. Um, we, we should have probably kept it in. Um, and this is just to show you that you select the ticket type, i.e. the offer type of adult before you confirm the opportunity. And what this means is that there are two things you need before you start the booking flow. You need the opportunity, which is, in this case, it's, it's Monday, 1st of April, Badminton. Uh, that's the opportunity. And then you also need the, the offer. Um, and that's adult. So when you have those two things, then you proceed to booking. And that kind of answers people's questions about how is it that you know if it's a child, if I don't know their date of birth? Well, it's because you've chosen the offer of a junior offer. And so opportunity plus offer is then what you're booking against. You can't book an opportunity without an offer. You have to have both. Um, and so that's then how you get to the page we did sh show on the day, which was this... Um, uh, kind of final booking step, but you do have to choose the offer first, and I think that was that's an important step that we missed. That logically, then means that well, that's how you know. Um, and the opportunity plus offer is also how you uh, deal with on peak off peak, because again, the opportunity. This is an example of my local pitch's grid. Um, the opportunity changes in price depending on the time. As you can see here, one o'clock in the afternoon is forty eight pounds. Seven o'clock in the afternoon is. 60 pounds and that, that's part of the opportunity so your opportunity which includes on peak off peak combined with um the offer which is adult or junior that's what gives you the, the thing you can book does that make sense yeah <clears throat> that's me uh, yeah, Shob, you going to say something? Uh, yeah, uh, it, it makes sense. Yeah, uh, it perfectly models the, the way we work in Legend, so that should be okay with us, yeah. Excellent, great. Thanks, guys. Um, so uh, then the next little thing was about trust and control. I haven't actually got a slide on this, but just to explain what, what this means, um, there aren't any controls at least in the specification that allow um at least that you could do it but there's nothing that suggests you should or shouldn't do it um that, that may, may, means that the booking system should apply any kind of control to what the broker can and can't do so some of the questions that we had following the workshop were things like in uh in gladstone or in legend how do i make it so that that broker a can book x and broker b can book y but not the other way around. Or how do I make sure that, you know, so broker A can only book off peak stuff or broker B can only book certain types of activities. Maybe broker B can only book Zumba. Um, and, uh, and maybe only, maybe broker C can use offer overrides, but maybe broker D can't use offer overrides and this kind of thing. So um, the way that the, the kind of one of the principles of the spec, and I think we've talked about this in, in previous calls, but just kind of reiterate it is, um, a bit like with most APIs you get access to, you can do a lot of stuff with them. Currently, a lot of the booking APIs work like this anyway. When you get access to booking, you can make bookings across all the things using all of the, you know, everything. You can book whatever you want. But obviously, what controls what you book is the contract, is the agreement, the arrangement that the broker has with the seller. Um, so if the seller, for example, GLL, has an arrangement with, for example, my local pitch that's only off-peak bookings, then they should expect my local pitch to only make off-peak bookings. If they do something, if they make an on-peak booking, that would be against their agreement. Um, and of course, they have the power to terminate that agreement, you know, as quickly as they want to, maybe with zero notice if they breach the contract. Um, and they will have control to do that. The API key can be revoked. So they'll be able to remove access from, uh, of, a, of, of a broker from their system. And so the way that this is kind of intended to work is it's trust-based. So you have 
rather than having really complicated, expensive controls in place that are a lot of extra work to administer, because you can imagine if, if someone said, you can only book GLL off peak uh, Zumba on a Tuesday and Thursday or something, then they would have, someone would have to go in and change lots of settings to make that happen and then change them back if someone changes their mind and all this kind of thing. So there'd be a lot of administrative overhead, administrative burden. There'd also be a lot of complexity in the system because you would need to build in those controls against each of the brokers and the administration panels would be crazy complicated. So the cost for administration and the cost for build goes up a lot. Um, and I suppose the question is, what, for what, what, what purpose? You know, what are we protecting against? And if all we're protecting against is the wrong booking being made because bookings will be made um, you know with the um, the money will be taken for them etc like it's as part of the contracts they've got in place and so I, I suppose it's it, it's not like they can get access to personal data that they're not supposed to or anything like that because it's locked down in that respect they haven't got access to any additional personal data there's no GDPR concerns here it's all just about whether they do what they're supposed to or not uh, and so, yeah, so just to say that currently the way this is all working is that it's about trust so that you have that contract in place and that contract should be respected. Obviously, that, that within the system, they can look at what bookings were made, running a report or whatever booking system to check against a particular broker what they've been, what they've been booking. And if they find in that report that things haven't been done properly, then obviously it's up to them to terminate the agreement, ask for the money back, whatever it is. Um, and and this is where obviously you go into business with people you trust and and if if there was concerns about uh, that level of trust then you would also have concerns about you know whether they would take the correct payments and all the other things that they could do wrong um, whether the people would be real would they submit correct personal data you, you could go into the nth degree of, of checking this stuff so ultimately it comes down to making sure partners are accredited uh, and, and trustworthy and that sellers only work with those partners that they're happy to work with. Um, and obviously if you get kind of a black mark against you, it's a small sector. So um, I imagine that you wouldn't, it wouldn't do you too well to try and circumvent the system if you were then to be terminated and then other people to hear about that. Um, so um, does that make sense as a kind of, as a principle? Yeah, totally makes sense. Yeah, it makes sense from legend point of view. Yeah, less work from for us to do. <laughs> always, always good. Yeah. Uh, perfect. Thank you, guys. Great. Um, and uh, and then finally the uh, uh, proposal for attendee detail capture. So one of the main things you probably would have seen at the end of that workshop, um, there was a big kind of discussion that lasted about fifteen minutes about. Uh, date of birth and things like that and so just to kind of show you what what we've done about that um, there's a github issue which is called attendee detail capture um, this kind of summarizes the, what was discussed in the in the room it's three main points so basically i think that the kind of requirements seem to be around safeguarding reporting and registration uh, which is basically safeguarding is the kid allowed to go to the activity are they underage? Is there a danger to that uh, being the case? Um, and the same with two to one ratio, you know, if, if there's too many kids for an adult, are they allowed through? Um, reporting, people were saying, you know, we want to demonstrate to Sport England that we've got enough people active, who are they? And looking into this in detail, there's all kinds of questions people are asking for reporting, uh, ethnicity, religion, all sorts of stuff that people need to know to show uh, diversity. I've got a bit of a bigger list here, um, medical conditions, disabilities, um, a bunch of personal questions they're asking to try and understand the kind of people who are coming in. Um, so there's a question about reporting, and then there was a question about registration, and this is things like the next of kin or the parents' details, things like that. Um, and so these are the main three reasons that we've seen to have kind of boil it down to, to why people want that additional information um, and a few people after the workshop said well wait, maybe we can just ask for date of birth as an additional field with the customer um, and, and that actually turns out to be problematic because the customer is actually the booker not the attendee and so the person booking might be the parent the attendee might be the child 
and it's the attendees information that you want for reporting the attendees information you want for safeguarding um, and the attendee that you want uh, in terms of registration you don't need the book of details so actually what we're talking about is capturing attendee detail which is slightly different to what we currently have in the spec which is only booking the, the booker details um, and so basically what this comes down to is for for safeguarding there's two options one is that you capture a date of birth of each attendee for example to make sure they're of the right age uh, and two is what we were talking about in the room is you just clear, clearly describe each opportunity to make sure it's clear what the, con the restraint restrictions are so if the restriction is age eight to ten that that is written on the activity itself so you can't get that wrong uh, when you when you book it you can't accidentally book the wrong ticket um, and so at the moment the current spec supports the description you can put those details in we're adding that free text restriction to allow for all types of descriptions of restrictions to be to be in there um, but it doesn't currently allow for a kind of a, a check based constraint is the date of birth right you can't you can't do that at the moment um, but that's what you would need to do you would need to capture date of birth and check it against what you'd expect um, and the same registration reporting there's no way of capturing any attendee details at the moment in the spec so you would need to capture all of this information uh, as, a, as a new thing um, and uh, you would need to do it per um, order item which is because each order item could be a different attendee so you could book with two friends and that would be three different items and so uh, yeah, if you booked with the three of you, that would be three items. You would need three different attendee details. Um, you also have a question of, well, if you do that, what if the same person books twice? For, so let's say you have a shopping basket full of this, this stuff. Two Zumba, two yoga, one trampoline, one crash. It could be that the same person actually is booking Zumba and yoga because they've done it on two different days. So do we then need to say, well, you know, is this person one like you do with cinema tickets and drag, drag and drop them onto your ticket? to say that's attendee one, that's attendee two. And, um, and the suggestion here is for, the, for simplicity, actually, we could just ask for duplicate information because we're just storing it for reporting and registration purposes. If it's the same person in both, um, it's a guest checkout ultimately. So you just uh, you could capture the same information on both. They could just as easily make a follow-up uh, booking um, and capture, you know, let's say that I have a friend and Izzy has a friend and we both go, I go to, to Zumba with this friend uh, on Monday and Izzy goes to yoga on Tuesday with the same person. Now we both would enter their attendee details from both of our respective bookings, but obviously as bookers we're different and any account stuff is totally different. So that person isn't really the same person uh, as far as there's, there's nothing to really connect them together unless we try and capture the email address of that person and try and match them. But then I, I've got to ask for that person's email address, my friend, and and so is Izzy, which is a bit more complicated as well, a few extra steps. And so I guess what it comes down to is uh, you, it, it might be simpler just to treat everyone as um, separate and not try to join them together unless uh, the booking system wants to try and do something clever. Um, and um, the delegates made it quite clear in the room that there was, a, there was a good group of people that said, you know, if I want to book me and my friend on, I don't really want to ask for their date of birth and email address. I just want to book my friend on because, and if I have to ask them for all this information, that's a barrier. I don't really want to go through that. If I don't know their exact date of birth, for example, or I'm a parent booking for my child and my, my, my child's friend, two children. Do I know my child's friend's date of birth? Do I need to ask the child's, par child's friend's parent for their date of birth to book them on? All these extra barriers. Um, when you know they're both 11 years old and you know that it's eight plus as a you know, age restriction. So why do I need the date of birth when I know they're definitely over eight because they're both 11. I just don't know exactly how old the 11 year old is. Um, so it's, you know, it's these kind of things. Um, so yeah, and, and GDPR basically says that we want to minimize the amount of data captured uh, by default, if unless it's absolutely necessary. And there's a good question about is reporting necessary? Is that a good enough reason? To capture all this additional data from people and their friends um, to know who they are. Um, so all of that being said, the suggested flow is basically to kind of jump straight to the, the, the model is we treat attendees as repeat, repeat attendees as different people so we don't try and do anything clever about you know Alex is booking on two of two things it's the same person 
you just duplicate that information. Um, and, um, and you can still apply automatic constraints to that because you can check if you've got a child uh, order for a particular order item, you can check the date of birth put against that order item is a child date of birth uh, and, and fits within that constraint. Same if you uh, booked a female ticket for something, you can check the female, they are female when they've booked. So you can, you can add those two constraints easily enough. Other constraints are slightly more difficult to do around things like ethnicity, but you probably wouldn't want to do that. Um, so th this is where, um, at the moment, it's those two are the main things people seem to be saying are the constraints of gender and, and, and date of birth. Um, and the way that it would work is that you would, uh, you would have a, um, when the order item is returned, when you do that initial quote, it gives you back, it says, these are the required fields I need for each attendee. I need email address, I need name, I need gender. And also specifies custom fields in the, in the form of what's this order item intake form. So you've got short answer, multiple choice answers. I mean, arguably an, a multiple choice question to get the, the age is much better than the date of birth. Asking buckets of 0 to 18, 18 to 30 will hit your, your reporting requirements without needing to capture that really specific personal data of date of birth. Um, so you could ask a multiple choice question like that. You can choose whether it's required or, or not required. Um, and then that information is then captured. And, and if, and the other thing is that at the quote stage, if you, if you get, you can get an error message saying that you don't have complete data. It basically just asks you to keep resubmitting the quote until you have all the data at which point you won't have any errors come, coming back and then you can go forward and submit the final order. Um, and this is an example of the kind of thing you would submit. You'd submit your attendee one per order item. As we said, it would just be duplicated if that same person booked on lots of things. Um, so you've got email address, phone number, all that registration detail if you need it, date of birth, gender, address. So they're all the standard fields. Um, that seem to be what most people are, are using as standard fields. But if you wanted to add additional fields, as we mentioned, if you want to capture religion, um, because that's something they need to enter as a required field to book onto a squash court, apparently this is actually happening in some places. Um, uh, so if you need to do that, uh, then you can, uh, you can do that. You can have a custom field and you can, you can even put a multiple choice drop down with a list of religions that you recognize and they can, they can choose from there. Um, and, uh, and, and this specifies that back as a value. Um, so, um, obviously, my, I, th I think my, my personal view here is that this is very excessive for allowing someone to access a facility. Um, however, um, because people in the community have requested this and we're very keen to make sure that this works and hopefully as, a, um, as unbiased as possible, these, these features allow you to do that in the detail you want them to, to, to do that. But I guess the question is, um, is this something that we put in this version of the spec? So um, getting them, people to feedback on this is something we're really looking for. And I'll ask in a second for you guys if you have any feedback on it. Um, I suppose our current thinking is that because this is quite late in the day to go through all the iterations that we would need, especially around the custom fields and make sure that multiple choice, um, integer, single text, all those things are, are what people need and that they capture all the different scenarios enough to move forward um, and also because attendee detail capture is a whole other thing that we haven't really included so far that we would leave leave this for now and put this in the kind of version 1.1 or later version but but leave it as an open issue that people can kind of contribute to as they look at the spec and go well this doesn't meet my needs if it's for this reason they can contribute to this and, and check it and see if this is what they're looking for before we kind of bake this into the spec and uh, in case it's too complicated maybe this is Maybe this does too much. Maybe there's a, a halfway version. Um, although from the sound of things, people needing ethnicity, things like that require you to have custom fields. And so it sounds like we can't get away with just the registration information. Um, because often if you're asking for date of birth, you're asking for it for a lot of other reasons. Um, so yeah, and oh yeah, and there's IDs associated. So if you do have religion or age or something stored, you can, you can use an ID to make sure that, um, let's say that you're storing a particular attribute about a person, let's say their, their home phone number, um, because you've got their mobile, but you also need the home phone number. You could, you could use an ID for home phone number there 
And that means if you ever ask for that information again, the broker could remember that and, and, and supply it a second time um, if, if it wants to do that to save you trying to fill it in. So obviously the, the broker then has the ability to remove these barriers as much as possible if they are being presented by the provider for, for legitimate reasons. Um, the broker can then uh, use the standard fields it's aware of here to try and pre-fill the address and date of birth if they're known. They might already be known if the broker's captured that before. Um, and rem remember the multiple choice answers for the second and third time they're entered so they don't need to go through the whole journey again if they're repeat bookers uh, for some reason. Um, so that's that kind of is a talk through of what we've done and that was the only major ba thing that came up following the workshop that people were kind of concerned about. So I don't know, do you guys have any questions on that or any thoughts? Uh, yeah, definitely some thoughts from me. So I think Great. I would definitely support um, moving this to a later version. Um, mm -hmm. I think from mine and Alison Savage's point of view, um, who kind of led on Open Active before I was here, um, we kind of had a chat about this and I completely agree. I think this is where actually someone booking something doesn't actually mean they turned up also. So I wouldn't even say that it works for reporting in some ways. Yeah. Um, so there's that side of thing. And obviously as Sport England, we want to capture data about participation, but I don't personally feel that it should be done at the booking stage necessarily. We're creating another barrier for consumers as you talk through, um, which aren't relevant. So I'm, I'll put in some thoughts on this, but um, certainly I think, there's some thinking for us as Sport England to do to kind of work with the sector to think about how we do capture some of this data if it's if the traditional for a better word way has been to capture it at the booking stage or you know as a as a member of a gym when I go into the gym you know that I'm a woman that I'm of you know that I'm white that I'm of a certain age like but obviously with this guest checkout type thing that isn't captured but then also, if I turn up to a gym as a someone just booking onto a session, as you went through the example of GLL, that data isn't always being captured by every provider. So I think there's just ways for us to explore other places where we can be capturing this data um, outside of Open Active, um, especially with the GDPR considerations and all that kind of jazz. So yeah, I'll happily contribute a bit to the GitHub issue and, and kind of chuck in my 10 pence worth and then um, more than happy if you're getting any queries from particular providers who are kind of saying Sport England wants us to re report on this. Um, I'm, I'm more than happy for you to put them in touch with me and we can figure out where that pressure is coming from as well to make sure that we're, I don't doubt that there are people within Sport England who want participation data and you know that's what we all want I guess at the end of the day to prove that any of this is happening and working but um, yeah, I just think there's different places we can we can capture that. But yeah, more than happy to have a conversation with anyone who's kind of uh, uh, is kind of quoting Sport England as, as as a reason to go down this route now. Great, that's hugely helpful. Um, thank you, Izzy. Um, does anyone else have any thoughts on this at all? Uh, not any that haven't already been mentioned. Uh, I think this is yeah definitely out of the one scope. Right. Okay. Cool. Um, so, uh, so yeah. So on that basis, then, um, just jumping back to the uh, doc a sec from this. Yeah. Great. So yeah, more thoughts. Um, very welcome in that issue. Please do comment, and we'll 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 watch and track that as it. Uh, develops that discussion. I, I sense that, especially as you were saying, Izzy, there, that there's probably a lot more to this um, uh, than, than maybe that, that workshop even surfaced for some of the motivations here around systems that operate in a certain way because they have previously always operated that certain way or um, things being captured because they've always been captured. And so I guess this is a really good opportunity for everyone to challenge and, and check the kind of status quo and see if that's still what we need. Maybe it is, um, but um, I guess that's yeah, great, great process. So, uh, cool. Okay, so that's what that is. And then um, just to kind of point this out again uh, uh, briefly. So this is the the the, the mi minimum required. I think show sure, kind of. I know we were talking about this earlier, but th there's a few endpoints that you you need to implement, and that is one, two, three, four endpoints that you would need to implement. Five, including order quotes, which were um, we're just discussing splitting into a separate endpoint for clarity. 
Um, so I should say at this point, there are a few um, minor tweaks uh, happening in terms of the um, kind of small semantic things around the spec, just to make sure it's kind of rest and things like that all work. So changing it from a put to a post, things like that. So we're going to try and get those tweaks completed by um, Wednesday next week to make sure that, that is everything's consistent and it all makes sense. Um, nothing massive, like it all fits within everything we've agreed and talked about in detail. Um, it's just going to be like really subtle semantics and making sure the naming is all consistent and plurals and singular terms and all this kind of you know, detailed stuff that um, it's good to get right. Now we're at the point where we can look at that because before we were at the point where some of this stuff was going to be cut completely or changed. So we're luckily at that detailed stage. Um, so yeah, so these are um, the kind of uh, the, the different endpoints required. We've tried to keep this as, as small as possible, so there's you know as as few as possible uh, endpoints, and uh, and the implementation can be as simple as possible. But as Shab pointed out before, it's still um, these are small but mighty endpoints. Uh, sometimes they uh, require a few different things to happen behind the scenes to, to to do that, depending on the complexity of the booking system. So it's not to say that they're very simple. Sometimes they are slightly complicated um, because of the num number of business rules in place in the booking system. Uh, but hopefully, in simple booking systems, they should be fairly simple to implement because the complexity really arises with the translation of what, what could be a simple request of placing an order through the amount of business logic that might exist in the system and, and mapping it to the internal representation of that in the system. Um, and so just, yeah, it was worth just re, uh, restating these. These are the kind of, this is the minimum, and then there's the optional that you can, you can have the lease for order quotes if you want to. Um, but yeah, so any, any other um, kind of final questions on, on that? Shob and I had a long chat before, but is there anything else there that you wanted to raise, Shob, or? Uh, not really. Uh, I think it makes sense. As you said, this is quite a lot of work. Uh, I was kind of hoping that cancellation probably would be in phase two, but it's there, so we'll have to do it. Because I think cancellation part is probably one quarter of the work for us at least in this whole thing so yeah we'll go through it and we'll raise concerns as we find them fantastic yeah, thank you and it's probably worth saying yeah i agree we were hoping to do it without cancellation as well um i think it was uh gll uh circo and a few others uh and everyone active who said that cancellation was uh crucial for them so that's um, mainly because they get a lot of cancellations apparently and they didn't want to handle them manually. So. Um, okay. Cool. So, uh, yeah, great. So the next steps then on the booking spec, Whee! <laughs> finally. So the idea is on the Wednesday next week, which is delayed because this was supposed to be Friday this week, but we've, we, we need a little bit more time to, to finish all these bits off. So um, uh, Wednesday next week, which still allows us to hit the end of the month deadline for the uh, ratification, which is now moving from the 27th of April to the 1st of May. And so that's that, that updated there. So we can still get it done in time for Legends timescales because I know that um, Sean was keen for us to get this done by the end of the month, just. Um, so the idea is that we will have this uh, uh, final tweaks done and uh, submitted on the 17th. And that'll give a two week clear window for anyone who want, has any objections to raise them as part of the formal process. And assuming that there's none, uh, then we'll have the, the spec be ratified on the 1st of May, um, which is great. And then we can do something else that isn't booking, which will be amazing for everybody who's been part of this for so long. Um, so, uh, uh, current conversations are well, maybe we should bring up roots and talk about that on the 24th of April. So that's what's penciled in at the moment as the next topic. Um, if we can remember what it was like before we talked about booking, uh, there was a time before booking, and I think there will be a time after as well. Uh, by the way, Nick, will you have some kind of a validator to validate the work that we are doing, like the endpoint detail, name of the endpoints, uh, and list of object properties, just like probably you had for. For the opportunity feed that's a great question yes uh, we are absolutely intending to build one um, the question is time scales of that and how quickly we can do that compared to your build 
Um, yes. But we'll see if we can do that in parallel. Um, so, um, so actually, on, next, on the next call, uh, Tim will be joining us, and Tim is is joining the ODI team to um, to help with this, not just this, but to, to take on this uh, work stream of, of, of standards uh, as part of the Open Active um, initiative within the ODI. And so he'll be looking at that, looking at the validator, and, and hopefully we'll be able to work together and figure out what the uh, minimum validation that is required. Uh, is and, and get that delivered. I mean, what timescales are you thinking, Sharab, or, or uh, what kind of validation would be most useful to you? Uh, it's basically most around the object metadata. Just like you have, let's say, got something like person, uh, definition of person in, currently in the spec for, uh, for the feeds over there on, on your website. So similarly, let's say for order, uh, we got a validator. So we, we, whatever we develop, uh, uh, we just uh, run run it past uh, through that thing and and then just get the feedback. Brilliant. So so if we have a validator like this one, is that what you're kind of thinking? This type of thing. So you put that in, it yeah. tells you errors. Yeah, the minimum. Uh, I think we'll probably be going with the minimum information. So whatever minimum we put in, it just tells us uh, whether we are missing something or the format is probably the format is wrong. The format. Perfect. So this is this is easy actually. We can we this validator is actually built based on a data model that is configurable. So we can we can very quickly get the uh, the new data model from the new spec into this validator. So it works with the order order items uh, those things. Um, so we'll do that as step one. Um, is that something that is that enough? Do you think, or do you need more than that? Or uh... I think that would be enough, actually. If if, we, if in your samples you got the minimum uh, list of uh, properties uh, with every object, at, at least the minimum, then we can simply copy and paste in our projects and uh, start playing with them and see what we are missing. So it will it will be helpful because yeah. sometimes I think in the samples you got more than minimum. Yes. So if you start with minimum, because there is quite a lot over there, I, I, I was looking earlier. So if you start with minimum and see what we can provide and then build up from there. That sounds perfect. Yeah, absolutely. I should say that some of the minimum, uh, it's minimum is sometimes case dependent. So, for example, I know that Legend were really concerned with tax. Um, tax is optional because mm -hmm. uh, tax is not in every system. Uh, no XN don't have tax, for example, but Legend do. So, I mean, do you, would you would you like to us to include things like tax in there? Um, or, uh, yeah, I think tax on ta on the subject of tax. Uh, we currently got one price which include tax. So if you got an organization which is tax exempt, like a like a person wants to, uh, organization that wants to make a booking, do we need to identify in legend and give the price that we bring back doesn't include tax? Is that what is your expectation? Uh, yeah. So the tax, well, the tax calculation basically breaks down the. Um, let's just jump. I'll show you the spec. So the tax calculation. Uh, kind of uh, if there's any tax uh, that's part of the price it's specified separately um, so let me just jump over here a sec so yeah uh, so let's go to just taxation so if tax calculation So you would need to include, maybe I'll just go to an example actually. Uh, order creation. So if the order quote comes back, the order quote would include, um, so there's a unit tax specification, which basically says how much of each um, price is, is tax. And if it's tax exempt, this could just be not included um, because there's no tax or it could be zero. It's up to you, um, but there's no tax, so it doesn't need a uh, tax specification. So will it be based on uh, the person who's uh, asking for the quote? It will be so based do we need to, do we need to I mean, detect who's asking for the quote because I thought it's, uh, part of it is anonymous, like anybody can go and ask for a quote. At that time, we don't know who that person is. And even after he's registered, I mean, as you said, the minimum you need to create a account in booking system, just email address and a couple of other fields. So 
So does it mean that we then need some extra information with every account holder that uh, so tell, us when, that, uh, tell us whether he's exempt or not? Well, so he's exempt if he's a person and not if he's an organization. Um, so when the, uh, when the seller, um, sorry, where the, when the, where's the customer? Uh, should be in here. Oh, it's probably in the previous one. In there you go, the customer. If the customer is a type person, um, then he is exempt from tax if the activity qualifies for it, because not all your activities qualify for tax exemption, and not all organizations do. So some legend customers will not have tax exemption. Some legend customers will. Um, uh, I, I rem remember Ian saying that this was quite complicated, but legend had it all sorted <laughs> or something. <laughs> Yeah, I, I think it's the other way around. I think if you are an organization, maybe by default, you may be exempt from tax. No, no, no. The it's, it's the other way. So a so, uh, person is exempt from tax because that is the, um, uh, we have the reference of the, of the legal stuff here. There's a tax exemption that applies uh, for situations where, um, this is it, the VAT eligible body. So it, only in the case um, of sports supplies that are particularly VAT exempt, and this is only a, this is only the case for certain bodies. So you have to be not for profit, not profit making. So basically, trusts, uh, if mm -hmm. you're a trust, um, and any one of those type of organisations. So uh, that then you are able to provide VAT exempt activities, and it is only uh, for consumers. So you have to, I can't remember where it says it, but it's only for consumers to buy. So you can't sell to businesses with this exemption. It has to be to a, another consumer. Okay, I, th I think we need to discuss about it more in detail uh, some other time. Uh, let me talk with somebody else over here and then, then we, can, we can see, uh, because I think it's a very complicated topic for us. That sounds good. Well, so I guess for the purposes of what we're talking about here, what, what I'll do is I will um, uh, include in the examples and um, that type of thing. So you have it there in the yeah. example. And then I guess when you talk it through, you can decide what you want to do. Uh, we can have- Yeah, both. I think, yeah, yeah. if you include it in, yeah, it will, it's an important thing. So we, we can discuss it at the time uh, we are designing it, yeah. Perfect. That sounds good. Um, well, great. Thank you very much. Um, so uh, we will make that validator happen, uh, Shav. That that sounds like a thing we can we can definitely do. So we'll make sure we release that as soon as we can after the spec, uh, and, and let everyone know the time scales. Uh, and that will be good. Because I thought you were going to say we need more validator stuff, but if that's enough, then perfect. <laughs> we will do that minimum, uh, just the right amount. Yeah. Um, so does anyone have any other business that they wanted to raise? Yeah, I had just a quick question about um, moving on to Roots next, which, you know, I think we're all excited to do non-booking stuff as much as I love talking about booking. Um, <laughs> I just wonder whether, um, and open to like other people's input obviously in this, but um, whether it's worth going back to the accessibility stuff for a bit or not, or whether we kind of, start talking about roots and then go back to accessibility or how we handle the two maybe it's a question also for tim once he's started but um just wanted to flag it now as a thing i was um, actually going to ask you this question before the call yeah. if you want to talk about accessibility i actually i looked at your document briefly and i wasn't sure based on the document whether it was ready for um this i don't think we've had many comments i think that which is you know i've sent it out to people but not everyone really commented on it um so yeah, I mean, maybe you and I can catch up um, okay. uh, separately on this and just think about, I just wonder whether having a call is kind of a focus point to like bring everyone back onto that. Maybe yeah. it only needs to be one that then we move on to Roots for a bit and just kind of have a regular check-in point on the accessibility stuff as a, because I think what we haven't had is, we had that call in October or September or whenever it was, which was good, kind of motivated people about it and then it kind of dropped off, which is, just the way the way these things have happened um uh you know, I, that's I, how it goes I, but yeah on the last call i believe that the actions were that you, you, there were a few people going to go away and do some research and come back again has that happened sort of um <laughs> to give a very fluffy answer 
I think I sort of said, yeah, I can do that. And then was like, what do I actually need to do? <laughs> so yeah, maybe right. you, and I, you and I can pick that up maybe separately and then we can figure out if it makes sense to, and again, it doesn't have to be that 24th of April call. It could be, you know, a few weeks after that, that we pick it up as a, as a kind of um, little special, special call or something. But um, yeah, we can figure it out. Okay. Yeah, that sounds great. Let's, let, let's definitely do that. Um, I'm aware Perfect. that, yeah. Hopefully Tim will be picking this stuff up, but as, as we said, we want to make sure that we don't dump him with a load of uh, and stuff on day one. So if it it might be a nice transition to have with the accessibility calls a nice in, um, but let's yeah let's let's talk it through and perfect. And thank you. Cool, no problem at all. Great. Um, well, thank you guys so much for coming, and thank you for anyone who's watching that you've made it through to the end of the end of the booking stuff because oh my goodness, this has taken a long time. Um, but thank you uh, and thank you guys uh, here for, for supporting this. Um, so, uh, so yeah, uh, with any luck, I'm crossing all my fingers, we'll be able to, next time we talk, we'll have the booking spec in a form that everyone's happy with and it's, it's, it's out and it's done. Uh, so um, yeah, great, it's been a journey. <laughs> well done nick for uh bearing with us all i think uh, on these calls <laughs> <laughs> absolutely group effort um thank you and uh great right well we'll see you guys on the 24th if not before uh and uh and take care and we'll we'll catch up individually show up uh, and easy on those yep perfect see you then cool bye. Thanks bye. bye guys bye, bye. bye. bye.